It was a wonderful night. Such a night that we can only experience when we are young. The sky was so starry, so bright that looking at it, one couldn't help but ask oneself whether ill-humored people could live under such a firmament. And that's a youthful question too, very youthful, but may the Lord put it more frequently into your heart. Well, speaking of ill-humored people, I can't help but recall my state of mind throughout that day. From early morning, I had been oppressed by a strange despondency. It suddenly seemed to me that I was lonely, that everyone was forsaking me, deserting me. Of course, you might be asking who I mean by everyone, for though I had been living in Petersburg almost eight years, I had hardly an acquaintance. But then what did I want with individual acquaintances? I was acquainted with all of Petersburg. That's why I felt so abandoned when everyone in Petersburg packed up and went to their summer villas. And for the three previous days, I had wandered about town profoundly dejected, not knowing why and not knowing what to do with myself. Whether I walked in the gardens or sauntered on the riverbanks, I saw none of the familiar faces of people I was accustomed to see at a specific time and place the rest of the year. They, of course, didn't know me, but I knew them. I knew them intimately. I had studied their faces and was delighted when they were happy and downcast when they were under a cloud. I almost struck up a friendship with one old man whom I saw every blessed day at the same hour by the river. Such a grave, pensive countenance. He was always whispering to himself and brandishing his left arm, while in his right hand he held a, a gnarled cane with a gold knob. He even seemed to notice and take a warm interest in me. That's how it was. Yes, we would almost stop to greet each other, especially if we were both in good humor. And on one occasion, when we hadn't seen each other in two days and met on the third, we were actually reaching for our hats, but realizing in time, dropped our hands and passed by each other with feigned indifference. <sighs> oh, I knew the houses, too. Oh, yes. As I walked along, they seemed to look out at me from their windows and almost say, Good morning. How are you? I'm going to have some minor repairs done tomorrow, or... I was almost burned down and had such a fright, <laughs> and so on. I had my favorites among them. Some were dear friends. One was to undergo a major facelift by the architect that summer, and I went by every day to make sure that the procedure was not a failure. God forbid. But I'll never forget an incident with a little house of a light pink color. It was such a charming little brick house. It looked so hospitably at me and so proudly at its ungainly neighbors that my heart rejoiced whenever I happened to walk by. And suddenly, one day as I walked along, I heard from my friend a plaintiff, they're painting me yellow, oh, the barbarians, the villains. <laughs> they had spared nothing, neither columns nor cornices, and my helpless little friend became as yellow as a canary. It almost made me sick to my stomach, and long afterwards, I lacked the courage to visit my poor, disfigured, jaundiced friend. So, now you can understand what I mean when I say I was acquainted with all of Petersburg. Ah, oh, well, in any event, as I said at the start, I had been worried for three whole days before I fully comprehended the cause of my uneasiness. On the street, I had felt ill at ease. This person failed to appear, and this person too, and what had become of another? And at home, I didn't feel quite like myself either. And for two evenings, I scanned my walls to think what was amiss. Why was I feeling so troubled? And in perplexity, I looked over all my furniture, examined every chair, wondering if the trouble lie there. For if one chair is out of place, I am not myself. But it was all in vain. 
I was not the bit the better for it. I even sent for Matrona and good-naturedly admonished her in regards to the cobwebs and sluggish behavior in general, but she simply stared at me in amazement and went away without saying a word. So the, the cobwebs remained limply hanging in place. But at long last, I realized what was wrong. They were all giving me the slip and making off to their summer villas. Everyone that had been in Petersburg was going or was leaving away for the holidays. Every dignified looking gentleman was at once transformed in my eyes into a respectable head of the household who, having completed his daily duties, was making his way to the bosom of a family comfortably ensconced in a summer home. Yes, passers-by all seemed to have a definite air that said to everyone they met, we're only here for the moment, and in another two hours we'll be going off to our country house. I fancied that everything was astir and moving. Everything was heading in regular caravans out of town. It seemed as though Petersburg threatened to become a wilderness, so that at last I felt ashamed, mortified, and sad that I had nowhere to go for the holidays and no reason to go away. I was ready to leave with every carriage, to drive off with every gentleman of respectable appearance, but no one, absolutely no one invited me. It seemed as though they had forgotten me, as though I were a stranger to them. So, that day I took a long walk, and managing, as I often did, to quite forget where I am, I suddenly found myself at the city gates. Instantly, I felt light-hearted, and I passed the barrier and walked between cultivated fields and meadows, unconscious of fatigue, feeling as though a burden had been lifted from my soul. And all those who drove by gave me friendly looks. They all seemed so pleased at something. And I felt pleased as I never had before. It was as though I had suddenly found myself in sunny Italy. So strong is the effect of nature upon a half-sick, suffocated townsman like me. There's something so inexpressibly invigorating about the countryside around Petersburg. When at approach of spring, she awakens with all the powers bestowed on her by heaven. And when she breaks into leaf, decks herself out and spangles herself with flowers. And yet, dear listener, my night was to be far better than my day. I had come back to town very late, and it struck ten as I approached my lodgings. My way lay by the canal embankment, and as I strolled along, I thought, At this hour, There's never another soul to be seen around here. Enjoying the solitude, I walked along humming. When I'm happy, I always hum to myself, like every happy man who has neither acquaintance or friend with whom to share his joy. And suddenly, I had the most unexpected encounter. At the railing overlooking the canal stood a woman leaning forward with her elbows on the rail. Her eyes were fixed on the muddy waters below, wearing a, a charming yellow hat and a jaunty little black mantle. She appeared to be a very attractive young woman. She didn't even seem to hear my footsteps and didn't even stir when I passed by with bated breath and loudly throbbing heart. I thought, strange, she must be deeply absorbed in something of great importance. But all at once I heard a muffled sob. I stopped as though petrified. Yes, I was not mistaken. The girl was crying. And in an instant later, I heard another sob. Oh my God. My heart sank. And timid as I am with women, I turned and took a step back towards her. But while I was searching for the right words, the girl came to herself, looked around at me, cast her eyes down, and slipped beside me along the embankment. I followed her, but divining this, she left the embankment, crossed the street, and walked along the opposite sidewalk. 
And with my heart fluttering like a captured bird, I dared not cross the street after her. And yet, all at once, chance came to my aid. Along her side of the street, there suddenly came into sight, and not far from the girl, a gentleman in evening dress of dignified years, but by no means dignified carriage. He was unsteadily hobbling ahead while cautiously leaning against the wall. The girl flew by him straight as an arrow with the timid haste one sees in all girls who want to avoid the tension of unsavory fellows. And no doubt the stumbling gentleman would not have pursued her if my good luck had not prompted him. Without a word to anyone, the gentleman lurched forward at full speed in pursuit of my unknown lady. And she was racing like the wind, but the staggering gentleman was overtaking and overtook her. The girl uttered a shriek, and I bless my excellent walking stick, which I had in my right hand on this occasion. In a flash, I crossed the street and was soon at her side. The presumptuous gentleman quickly took in the situation, saw my stick, and fell back without a word. And only when he was very far away did he protest against my actions. And then he did so in rather vigorous language, but his words hardly reached us. Give me your arm, and he won't dare to annoy us further. She took my arm without a word, still trembling with excitement and terror. Oh, obtrusive gentleman, how I blessed you in that moment. I stole a glance at her. She was indeed very charming, and on her black eyelashes there still glistened a tear. From her recent terror or former grief, I don't know, but... There was already the gleam of a smile on her lips. She too stole a glance at me, faintly blushed and looked down. Why did you rush away from me? If I had been there, nothing would have happened. But I, I didn't know you. I thought that you too. Do you know me now? A little. For instance, I see that you're trembling. Why? You're right. <laughs> You can see the sort of man I am. I'm shy with women, and as a result, I'm almost as nervous and agitated as you were a minute ago when that gentleman alarmed you. In fact, I'm in some alarm right now. What? Really? Yes. If my arm trembles, it's because it's never been held by a pretty little hand like yours. I'm a complete stranger to women. That is... I've never really been comfortable with them. You see, I, I live alone. I don't even know how to talk to women. I don't know whether I've said something completely silly to you. Tell me, honestly, I swear I won't be offended. No, no, quite the contrary. And if you insist on my speaking honestly, I'll tell you that most women like such timidity. And well, I like it too. I won't rush away from you again till I get home. You'll cause me to lose my timidity, then farewell to all my chances. Chances? Chances of what? That doesn't sound so gentlemanly. I beg your pardon. I'm, I'm sorry. It was a, a slip of the tongue. But how can you expect one at such a moment not to want... Uh... To be liked? Well, yes. But do, for goodness sake, please be kind. Understand here, I I'm 26 and I've never really known any woman. How can I speak well tactfully and to the point? It will make more sense once I've told you everything openly. I don't know how to be silent when my heart is speaking. Believe me, not one woman, never, ever, no acquaintance of any sort. And I do nothing but dream every day that at last I shall meet someone, but... Oh, if only you knew how often I had been in love in my imagination. How? With whom? Why, with no one. With an ideal. With someone I dream of in my sleep. I make up several romances in my dreams. Ah, you don't know me, it's true. I've known two or three women, but what sort of women were they? They were all landladies or housekeepers who... But I'll make you laugh if I tell you that I've several times just thought of going up to some proper lady on the street and 
talking to her. I, I need hardly say speaking to her, of course, timidly, respectfully, and yet passionately telling her that I am perishing in my solitude, begging her not to shoo me away, saying that I have no chance of making the acquaintance of any woman impressing upon her that it is an honorable duty for a woman not to repulse so tentative a prayer from such a luckless man as me, that in fact all I ask is that she should sympathetically share two or three sisterly words with me. <laughs> Just two words, even though we never meet again afterwards. <laughs> but you're laughing. I don't be insulted. I'm only laughing at your being your own worst enemy. If you had tried, you might have succeeded, even in the street. No kind-hearted woman, unless she were stupid or perhaps preoccupied with something at the moment, could bring herself to send you away without those two words which you ask for so timidly. Well, thank you. You don't know what good you've done me by saying that. I'm glad, I'm glad. But tell me, what made you think that I was the sort of woman who... Well, who would be worthy of attention and friendship, and not a landlady or housekeeper, as you say? What made you decide to approach me? What made me? Uh, but you were alone. There was that insolent gentleman. It's night. You must admit it was a duty. No, no, I meant before. Earlier. You know you meant to come up to me earlier? Really, I, I don't know how to answer what to say. I've, I've been happy today. I was walking along singing. I'd been out in the country. I, I hadn't been that happy for so long, and there you were. Perhaps it was my imagination, but for, forgive me for referring to it, but I fancied you were crying, and I couldn't bear to hear it. It, it made my heart ache. And my goodness, why wouldn't I be concerned about you? Surely there was no harm in my feeling brotherly compassion for you. Y yes, brotherly compassion. Surely I thought you wouldn't be offended by my involuntary impulse to go up to you. Stop, that's enough. Don't talk of it. It's my fault for speaking of it. But I am glad I was not mistaken in you. Uh, uh, here, I I'm home. I must go down the side street. It's two steps from here. Goodbye, and thank you. Wait, uh, you don't mean that we shall never see each other again? Surely this isn't to be the end. <laughs> First she only wanted two words, and now. But who knows? Perhaps we shall meet again. I'll come here tomorrow. Oh, forgive me. I'm imposing. I'm already making demands. Yes, you're not very patient. You're almost insisting that we continue. Wait, uh, listen. Forgive me if I confess something else to you. I tell you, I can't help coming here tomorrow. I'm a dreamer with so little real life that I look upon such moments as this one now was so rare that I can't help going over them again and again in my mind I shall be thinking be dreaming about you a whole night a whole week a whole year I will certainly come back here to this place tomorrow here to this spot and I'll be happy remembering today I already have two or three such spots in Petersburg I've even shed tears over the treasured memories associated with them like you perhaps Perhaps you were weeping over some memory when I first saw you? Oh, but forgive me. I only meant to say that perhaps at one time you were particularly happy? Very good. Maybe I will come here tomorrow too, at 10 o'clock. I see that I can't prevent you, and the fact is that I have to be here. But don't imagine that I'm making a date with you. I, I tell you in advance that I have to be here for my own reasons, but... Well, I'll be honest. I don't mind if you do come. To begin with, something unpleasant might happen as it did today, but never mind that. 
In short, I would simply like to see you. To say my two words to you. Only please don't think the worst of me now. Don't think that I make rendezvous so lightly. I, I wouldn't make it except that. Oh, but that will be my secret for now. The only let's have an agreement. An agreement? To speak, uh, tell me, tell me. I agree to anything. I am ready for anything. I will be obedient, respectful, and you already know me. <laughs> It's just because I do know you that I ask you to come tomorrow. Yes, I think I do know you. But listen, you will come on one condition and be good and do what I ask. You see, I speak frankly. Don't fall in love with me. You can't do that, though I assure you I want us to be friends. But you mustn't fall in love with me, I beg you. I swear. Hush, don't swear. I can see that your emotions are only too ready to flare up like gunpowder. Don't think badly of me for saying so. If only you knew... Like you, I've no one to open up to. No one who I can turn to for advice. Of course, one doesn't find a confidant in the street, but you are an exception. I feel I know you as though we've been friends for 20 years. You won't deceive me, will you? You'll see. The only thing is, I don't know how I'm going to survive till tomorrow night. <laughs> Try to sleep soundly. Good night, and remember that I trust you. You know, you put it so well just now. Surely one can't be condemned for brotherly compassion. That was so sweetly put that I immediately believed that I could confide in you. For God's sake, do. But uh, about what? What is it? Wait till tomorrow. Meanwhile, let it be a secret. So much the better for you that it will give it the faint flavor of romance. And maybe I'll tell you tomorrow, and maybe not. First, I'll want to talk with you a bit more. We'll get to know each other better. Oh, yes, I will tell you all about myself tomorrow. But... What has happened? It's as though a miracle has befallen me. My God, where am I? Come, tell me, aren't you glad that you didn't shoo me away, that you didn't repulse me at the first moment? In two short minutes, you have made me happy forever. Yes, happy. Who knows? Perhaps you've helped reconcile me to myself, helped me overcome my self-doubts. You see, I have all these nagging feelings that but I'll tell you all about that tomorrow. You shall know everything. Everything. Okay, I consent. We'll begin. Agreed. Goodbye, then. Till tomorrow. Till tomorrow! And we parted. I walked about all night. I couldn't just go home. I was so ecstatic. Oh, tomorrow. Oh, tomorrow. And then there was the second white night. Well, so you have survived. I've been waiting here for the last two hours. You don't know what a state I've been in all day. <laughs> I know, I know. But to business. Do you know why I've come? Not to talk nonsense as I did yesterday. No, we must behave more sensibly in the future. I I've thought a great deal about last night. In what way? How must we be more sensible? Believe me, I I'm ready to do my part, but really nothing more sensible has happened to me in my life than this now really um i have to tell you that i spent a long time thinking about you today and what did you conclude conclude well i believe that we should begin all over again because 
I realized today that I really don't know you at all. And I acted like a child last night, like a little girl. The fact is it's my own soft heart that's to blame. Anyway, to correct my mistake, I've made up my mind to find out all about you. But as I have no one else from whom I can find anything out, you have to tell me everything yourself. So what sort of man are you? Come now, begin. Tell me your whole story. My story? My story. But where did you get the idea that I have a story? I have no story. <laughs> then how have you lived if you have no story? Absolutely without any story. I've lived, as they say, keeping myself to myself. That is, alone. Utterly, entirely alone. Do you know what it means to be alone? But how alone? Do you mean you never see anyone? Oh, no, I see people, of course, but still I'm alone. How? Don't you ever talk to anyone? Strictly speaking, with no one. Are you then? Explain yourself. Wait, I'll guess. I'll bet, like me, you live with a maiden aunt. Mine is blind and will never let me go anywhere since I've almost forgotten how to talk. And when I acted out two years ago and she saw there was no controlling me, she called me in and pinned my dress to hers, and ever since then we sit like that for days together. She knits a stocking, though she's blind and I sit beside her, sewing or reading aloud to her. It's so strange. For two years, I've been pinned to her. Good God. How horrible. But no, I don't have an aunt like that. Well, if you don't, why do you sit at home? Listen, do you really want to know what sort of fellow I am? Yes, yes. In the most precise terms? In the most precise terms. All right, then. I am what some people might call an extremely peculiar character. An odd bird. <laughs> <laughs> an odd bird. What do you mean by that? You know, you're very entertaining. I do enjoy listening to you, and... There's no one around to hear or interrupt us. So, tell me your story. For I can't believe you don't have one. I know you have a story. Only you're wanting to keep it a secret. To begin with, what do you mean by an odd bird? An odd bird? <laughs> um, well, it's a unique sort of absurd kind of person, a, a, a character. Listen. Do you know what kind of person a dreamer is? A dreamer? Of course I do. I'm a dreamer myself. Sometimes as I sit beside my aunt, all sorts of things come into my head. Why, when I begin dreaming, I let my imagination run away with me. Why, I marry a... a, a Chinese prince. <laughs> yes, sometimes it's a very good thing to dream. But other times, maybe not so much especially when one has something more important to think about or do. Excellent. If you've been married to a Chinese emperor, you'll completely understand me. Then listen. Oh, but wait a minute. I don't even know your name. <laughs> you've never asked. Oh my goodness, it never occurred to me. I, I felt quite happy as it was. My name is Nastia. Nastia. And nothing more? And nothing more. Why? Isn't that enough for you? Not enough. On the contrary, it's a great deal, a, a very great deal, Nastia, to be on a first-name basis with you. All right. But your story? Well then, Nastia, now for my absurd story. There are, Nastia, though you may not know it, strange nooks and crannies in Petersburg. 
It seems as though the sun that shines for most Petersburg people does not peep into those corners, but another different light illuminates them. And in these corners, my dear Nastia, quite a different life is lived, quite unlike the life that's surging around us, but such as perhaps exists in some unknown realm, far from our serious, over-serious time. Well, that life is a mixture of something purely fantastic, fervently idealized, and something, alas, Nastia, something dingy, dull, and ordinary even incredibly vulgar. Goodness, what a beginning. What's next? Listen, Nastia, listen. Let me tell you that in these corners live strange people, dreamers. The dreamer, if you want an exact definition, is not a human being, but a creature of another sort. For the most part, he settles in some inaccessible corner as though hiding from the light of day. Once he settles into his corner, he grows into it like a snail or a tortoise, a creature which is an animal and a house both at once. Why do you suppose he is so fond of his four walls, which are invariably painted green, are grimy, dismal, and reeking unpardonably of tobacco smoke? Why is it that when this absurd gentleman is visited by one of his few acquaintances, and he ends up eventually losing all his friends, why does this absurd person meet his guest with such embarrassment and confusion, as though he had just committed some crime within his four walls, as though he had been forging counterfeit notes, or as though as though we were writing verses to be sent to a letter with an anonymous letter in which he states the real poet is dead and the sender thinks it is his sacred duty to publish the poems? Why? Tell me, Nastia, why is it conversation is not easy between the two friends? Why is there no laughter? Why does no lively word fly from the tongue of the perplexed newcomer, who at other times may be very fond of laughter, amusing exchanges, conversation of the fair sex, and other cheerful subjects? And why does this friend, probably a new friend, and on his first and only visit, for he will never come again, suddenly sees his hat and hurriedly depart, snatching away his hand from the warm grip of his host who was trying his utmost to show his regret and save the lost situation. Why does this friend chuckle as he goes out the door and swear never to come and see this peculiar creature again? Though this peculiar creature is really a very good fellow, and why, at the same time, can't he refuse his imagination the little diversion of comparing the odd fellow's countenance during their conversation with the puzzled expression of a lost puppy? Hold on. I don't know why such things occur, but I'll bet this all happened to you just as you describe it. Most definitely. Well, okay, then go on. How does it all end? You want to know, Nastia? What our hero, and that would be me for the hero of this whole ordeal, was my humble self, did in his little corner? You want to know why I lost my head? Why I was so startled by the unexpected visit of a friend? You want to know why I was so startled? Why I blushed when the door of my room was opened and why I wasn't able to entertain my visitor and why I was crushed under the weight of my own failed hospitality? Yes, yes, of course. But while you describe it all so splendid, splendidly, couldn't you perhaps describe it a little less splendidly? You talk as though you were performing on a stage. Nastia, Nastia, I know I describe with a certain kind of splendid excess, but excuse me, I don't know how else to do it. At this moment, at this moment, dear Nastia, I feel like the spirit of King Solomon, when after lying a thousand years under seven seals in his urn, those seven seals were at last taken off. At this moment, when we have met after such a long separation, for I have known you for ages because I have been looking for someone like you for ages. And that is a sign that it was you I was looking for and it was ordained that we should meet now. At this moment, a thousand valves have opened up in my head and I must let myself flow in a river of words or I shall choke. And so I beg you, Nastia, not to interrupt me, but 
listen patiently or I will be silent. All right, all right. Go on. I won't say another word. I continue. There is, gentle Nostia, one hour in my day which I especially like. That is the hour when almost all business, work, and duties are over, and everyone is hurrying home to rest, to play, and on the way are all contemplating the cheerful activities that will fill their evenings, their nights, and all the rest of their free time. At that hour, our hero, for uh, allow me, Nostia, to tell my story in the third person, for one feels awfully ashamed to tell it in the first person, and so... At that hour, our hero, who had his work too, was racing along with the others. But a strange feeling of happiness animated his pale, rather crumpled-looking face. He looked not with indifference on the evening glow, which was slowly fading in the cold Petersburg sky. And when I say he looked, I'm misspeaking. He didn't look at it, but saw it absentmindedly, as though preoccupied with some other more interesting subject. He scarcely spared a glance for anything outside himself. He was, however, pleased because till the next day he was released from some irksome business and happy as a schoolboy let out of class to his games and mischief. Looking at him, Nastia, you will see that all at once this joyful release has already had an effect on his weak nerves and overly excitable fancy. You see, he's lost in thought about what? The evening before him, dinner, is he looking at that dignified gentleman who was bowing so picturesquely to the lady who rolls by in a carriage drawn by prancing horses? No, Nastia. What are all those trivialities to him now? He is lost in his own inner world. Yes, he has suddenly become rich. The fading sunset sheds its farewell gleam so gaily before him and calls forth a swarm of impressions from his warmed heart. Now he hardly notices the road on which the tiniest details at other times would strike him. Now the goddess of fancy has already with delicate fingers begun spinning her golden warp and weaving upon it patterns of a marvelous magic life far from the granite pavement upon which he walks. Stop him now and ask him where he's standing, through what streets he's going. He will probably remember nothing neither where he is going nor where he is standing, he strides on, scarcely noticing that more than one passerby smiles and turns around to look after him, and that a little girl moves out of the way in alarm, gazing open-eyed at his broad, meditative smile and gesticulations. But his fancy catches up in its playful flight, the curious passers-by and the laughing child, and capriciously weaves everyone and everything into his mental tapestry like flies in a spider's web. And it is only after this odd bird has returned to his comfortable den, has sat down and finished his dinner, that he comes to himself. When the always thoughtful and depressed Matrona who waits upon him clears the table and gives him his pipe, then he recalls with surprise that he has dined, though he has absolutely no notion how it happened. The room grows dark, his soul is sad and empty, the whole kingdom of fancies drops to pieces about him, drops to pieces without a trace, without a sound, floats away like a dream, and he cannot himself remember what it was he was dreaming. And yet a vague sensation faintly stirs his heart and temptingly tickles and excites his fancy and imperceptibly evokes a swarm of fresh phantoms. Though stillness reigns in his little room, imagination is fostered by solitude and idleness. It simmers like the water with which old Matrona is making as she moves quietly about the kitchen close by. Now it flares up in the book picked up aimlessly and at random drops from my dreamer's hand before he's reached the third page. His imagination is again stirred and at work and again a new world, a new fascinating life opens vistas before him, a fresh dream, a fresh happiness, a fresh rush of ethereal, voluptuous poison. What is real life to him? To his eyes we live, you and I, Nostia, so sluggishly, slowly, insipidly. In his eyes we are all so dissatisfied with our fate, so exhausted by our lives. Yes, everything is cold, morose, and unpleasant among us. Poor things, thinks our dreamer. And it's no wonder he thinks that. 
look at those magical phantasms which so freely grew before him in such thrilling animated pictures in which the most prominent figure in the foreground is, of course, himself, our dreamer. See what varied adventures and what endless swarm of ecstatic dreams he partakes. You wonder what it is he's dreaming about? Why, of everything, of the lot of the poet, first unrecognized, then crowned with laurels, of friendships with Shakespeare, of conquering cities with Alexander or Napoleon, of standing up with religious martyrs and revolutionaries, of Cleopatra and her lovers, or, or simply of a little home of one's own. And beside one, a dear creature who listens to one on a winter's evening as you are listening to me now. Nastia, Nastia, what is there for this voracious idler in this life which you and I hold so dear? He thinks this is a poor, pitiful life, not for seeing that for him too, maybe sometime the mournful hour will strike when for one day of this pitiful life, he would give all his years of fantasy. But so far, that perilous occasion has not arrived. In the meantime, he desires nothing because he is satiated, because he is the artist of his own life and creates it for himself every hour to suit his latest whim. And you know this fantastic fairyland is so easily, so naturally created as though it were not a delusion of the imagination, but concrete, real, substantial. Yes, Nastia, the dreamer deceives himself and unconsciously believes that real, true passion is stirring his soul. He unconsciously believes that there is something living, tangible in his immaterial dreams. But is it delusion? Here love, for instance, is bound up with all its fathomless joy, all its torturing agonies, and his bosom only look at him. Would you be convinced, looking at him, dear Nastia, that he has never known her whom he loves in his ecstatic dreams? Can it be that he's only seen her in seductive visions and that this passion has been nothing but a dream? Surely they must have spent years together, hand in hand, alone, the two of them, casting off all the world and each uniting his or her life with the others. Surely when the hour of parting came, she must have lain her sobbing, grieving head against his breast, heedless of the soul and sky, heedless of the wind which snatches and bears away the tears from her black eyelashes. Can all of that have been a dream? That garden, dejected, forsaken, run wild with its little moss-grown paths where they used to walk so happily together, where they hoped, grieved, loved each other for so long, so fondly, in that strange ancestral house where she spent so many years lonely and sad with their silent, morose old husband who frightened them. While timid as children, they hid their love from each other. What torments they suffered, what agonies of terror, how innocent, how pure was their love, and good heaven, surely he must have met her afterwards, far from their native shores, under alien skies, and the dazzling splendor of an elegant ball, and a palazzo. It must be in a palazzo. Wreathed in a sea of lights, in myrtle and roses, where recognizing him, she hurriedly removes her mask, and whispering, I am free, flings herself trembling into his open arms and with the cry of rapture for one instant they forget their sorrow and their parting and the gloomy house and the old man in the dismal garden in that distant land and that last passionate kiss with which she tore herself away from his arms numb with anguish and despair oh god nastia you must admit that our dreamer would be shocked, betray confusion, and, and blush like a schoolboy when the previously mentioned uninvited visitor, some stalwart lanky fellow of a festive soul fond of a joke, opens the door and shouts out in a name greeting as though nothing were happening. My God, the old count is dead. Unutterable happiness is close at hand, and, and this unexpected guest comes barreling through my door. Surely you've not lived like that all your life. All my life. All my life, Nastia, and I'm afraid it shall go on that way till the end. No, that won't do. That must not be. That would be like my spending the rest of my life pinned to my aunt. One can't live like that. I know. 
I know, Nasty, I, I realize now more than ever that I have wasted so many years, and I feel it now more painfully that God has sent me you, my good angel, to come and, and show me that. When I talk with you, it's painful to think of the future, for there is nothing waiting me, waiting for me but a cold, musty, old, useless life. And what can I possibly dream about after I've been so happy in reality with you? God bless you, dear girl, for not having chased me away and for enabling me to say that for two evenings at least, I have lived. Oh, no, 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 it must not be, we must not part like that. What are two evenings? Oh, Nastia, Nastia, you don't know how far you have reconciled me to myself. I'll not think as ill of myself as I have in the past, and don't imagine that I have been exaggerating anything. For goodness sake, please don't think that, Nastia. For there are times that I feel so lonely and miserable that at such times I think I'm incapable of beginning a life in real life. It seems to me I've lost all touch, all instinct for the actual, the real. Yes, after my fantasy filled evenings, I have moments of sobriety which are awful. I hear the whirl and roar of the crowd and the life around me. I hear I see men living in reality. I see that life for them is not a vision, that their lives do not float away like a dream, that their lives are eternally renewed and every hour is different from every other. While my fantasy is spiritless, the slave of shadows. Yes, eventually, after years of inexhaustible fantasy, dreams become weary and worn out with continual exercise. As you grow into adulthood, you outgrow your old dreams. They're broken, shattered into fragments, into dust. And if there's no other life, you must build one up from these fragments. And while the soul longs for something new, the dreamer vainly rakes over his old dream, seeking a spark among the embers to fan it into flame, to warm his chilled heart by the rekindled fire and rouse up in it again all that was so sweet that set his blood boiling, drew tears from his eyes and so luxuriously deceived him. Oh God, Nastia. You must admit that our dreamer would be shocked to learn that it will be dreadful to be left alone, utterly alone, and not even to have anything to regret. All lost, stupid, empty, nothing but dreams. That's horrible, stop. Let's look forward. From now on, we can be two together. Whatever happens to me, we shall never part. Listen to me. I'm a simple girl. I've had very little education, though Auntie did get a teacher for me, but I understand you. For what you've described, I've also been through when Auntie pinned me to her dress. Of course, I, I couldn't have described it as well as you have. I'm not educated. But I am glad that you have been so open with me. I feel as though I know you, all of you, and now I want to tell you my story too, without concealing anything. And after that, you must give me advice. You're a very intelligent man. Will you promise to advise me? Uh, Nastia, I've never really given anyone advice. Still less good advice, but I suppose if we are going to be true friends, each of us will try to need to give the other a great deal of sensible advice. So. Pretty Nastia, how may I help you? At this moment, I feel so happy and so bold that I shouldn't be at a loss for words, even sensible words. <laughs> no, I, I don't only want sensible words. I want warm, brotherly advice, as though you've been fond of me all your life. Agreed, Nastia, agreed. If I had been fond of you for 20 years, I couldn't have been more fond of you than I am right now. Well, all right, here's my story. Half of it you already know. That is, who knows that I have an elderly, blind, maiden aunt. If the other half is as short as that. Be quiet and listen. You have to agree not to interrupt me or I'll muddle everything up. Please listen quietly. I 
have an older aunt. I came into her hands when I was quite a little girl for my mother and father are dead. My aunt was once richer than she is now. She often recalls those better days. She taught me French and then hired me a private tutor. When I was 15, those lessons stopped. It was around that time that I got into mischief. What I did, I won't say. I'll just tell you that it wasn't very serious. But Auntie called me to her one morning and said that as she was blind, she could not look after me. She took a pin and pinned my dress to hers and said that if I did not behave better, we would sit like that for the rest of our lives. At first, it was impossible to get away from her. I had to work to read and to study all beside Auntie. I tried to trick her once and persuaded Fekla to sit in my place. Fekla is our housekeeper. She's deaf. Fekla sat there instead of me. Auntie was asleep in her armchair at the time, and I went off to see a friend close by. Well, it ended badly. Auntie woke up while I was out and started asking some questions, thinking I was still sitting quietly next to her. Fekla saw that Auntie was asking her something, but she couldn't tell what it was. She didn't know what to do. Finally, she just undid the pain and ran off. <laughs> 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 Don't laugh at Auntie. I only laugh because it's funny. What can I do since Auntie is like that, but I'm still very fond of her? No. Well, I did catch it that time. I had to sit down in my place at once, and after that, I was not allowed to move no matter what. Oh, I, I forgot to tell you that our house belongs to us. That is to Auntie. It is a small, old wooden house with a cozy little upper floor. Well, a, a new lodger moved into that upper story. Then you had a previous lodger? Yes, of course. And one who knew how to hold his tongue better than you do. In fact, he hardly ever used his tongue at all. He was a mute, blind, lame, dried up, tiny old man who at last withered away and died. So then we had to find a new lodger, for we could not live without a lodger. The rent, along with Auntie's pension, is almost all we have. But the new lodger, as luck would have it, was a young man, a stranger not from around here. As he did not haggle over the rent, Auntie accepted him, and only afterwards did she question me further. Tell me, Nastia, what is our lodger like? Is he young or old? I didn't want to lie, so I said that he wasn't exactly young, and that he wasn't old. And is he pleasant looking? Again, I didn't want to lie. Yes, he is pleasant looking, Auntie. Oh. <laughs> oh, what a nuisance. What a nuisance. I tell you this, niece, you mustn't pay too much attention to him. What times we live in. We have to take in a lodger, and then he has to be pleasant looking too. Things were very different in the old days. Auntie was always reminiscing about the old days. She was younger in the old days, the sun was warmer in the old days, and cream did not turn sour in the old days. It was always better in the old days. I sat still and held my tongue, but asked myself, why does Auntie bring this up with me? Why does she care whether the lodger is young and good looking? But that was all. The thought crossed my mind, and then I went back to counting my stitches, began knitting my stocking, and forgot all about it. Well, one morning, the lodger came to see us. He asked about a promise to pay for his rooms. One thing led to another, and he was talkative. Uh, go, Nastia, into my bedroom and bring me my reckoner. I don't know why, but I was embarrassed. I jumped up at once to go, forgetting that I was pinned to my aunt. Instead of quietly and artfully undoing the pin so that the lodger could not see, I jumped up, almost dragging my aunt out of her chair. When I saw that the lodger had become aware of the safety pin, I blushed, stood stone still as though I had been shot, and suddenly began to cry. I felt so ashamed and miserable in that moment that I didn't know what to do. Girl, what are you waiting for? And I became even more mortified. 
when the lodger saw saw that I was ashamed on his account, he bowed and went away at once. After that, I was ready to die at the least sound in the passage. It's the lodger, I would think. I would stealthily undo the pin just in case, but it was never him. A couple of weeks passed, and the lodger sent word to Auntie through Fecla that he had a number of French books, and that they were all good books that she might like me to read and even read to her. Auntie gratefully accepted them, but worried. Are they properly moral books? If they are immoral, it would be out of the question for you to read them, for one can be led astray by evil books. But what exactly would I learn, Auntie? What kinds of evil things are written in those books? Well, what's described in them is how young men seduce virtuous girls. How on the excuse that they want to marry them, they carry them off from their parents' houses. How afterwards they leave these unhappy girls to their fate, and these girls perish in the most pitiful way. I've read great many of such books, and the stories are so vividly and well told, I would sit up all night and read them on the sly. <laughs> Yes, yes. Uh, but, mind, you, Nastia, you shouldn't read them. What books has he sent? It, they're all Walter Scott's novels, Henty. Walter Scott's novels? But wait, there might be some trick here. See if there isn't a love letter stuck in among them. No, Henty, there wasn't a love letter. Oh, be sure to check under the binding. Sometimes the sneaky fellows stuff it under the binding. The rascals. No, Auntie, there was nothing under the binding. Oh, well, that's all right then. So we began reading Walter Scott, and in a month or so we had read almost half the books. Then he sent us more and more. He sent us Pushkin too, so that at last I could not conceive of life without books. And gradually I stopped dreaming about how nice it would be to marry my Chinese prince. That's how things were when I happened one day to meet our lodger on the stairs. Auntie had sent me to fetch something. <laughs> he stood still. I, I blushed and he blushed. He laughed and I giggled. He said good morning, asked after Auntie, and then asked, Well, have you read the books? I answered that I had. Which one did you like best? Ivanhoe and Pushkin, best of all. And that was it on that occasion. A week later, I met him again on the stairs. This time, Auntie had not sent me out. I wanted to get something for myself. It was past two, and the lodger used to come home around then. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Tell me, is it boring, sitting all day with your aunt? When he asked me that, I blushed. I, I don't know why, I guess I felt ashamed that other people had begun to wonder why I never left my aunt's side. I wanted to go away and hide without answering, but I, I hadn't the strength. Uh, listen, you're a respectful and thoughtful girl. Excuse my speaking to you like this, but I can assure you that, like your aunt, I only mean the best for you. Tell me, have you any friends that you could go and visit? I told him that I didn't have any. That I had one friend, Mashenka, but she had moved away to Moscow. Well, uh, um, uh, how would you like to go to the theater with me? To the theater? But what about my aunt? Uh, but could you go without your aunt knowing it? No, I wouldn't want to deceive my aunt. Goodbye. Uh, well, all right, goodbye. He said nothing more. Only after dinner, he came to see us and spent a long time talking to Auntie. He asked her whether she ever went out anywhere, whether she had any acquaintances. And suddenly... You know, I've taken a box at the opera this evening. The company's presenting the Barber of Seville. Uh, my friends meant to go, but are unable to attend, so the tickets are left on my hands. Oh, the Barber of Seville? Why, the same opera they used to act in the old days? Yes, it's the same old barber. <laughs> <laughs> 
He glanced over at me. I, I saw what it meant and turned crimson, and my heart began throbbing with suspense. To be sure, I know it well. Why, I took the part of Rosina myself. In a private performance, of course, in the old days. Uh, well, wouldn't you like to go today? <clears throat> uh, otherwise, my tickets would be wasted. By all means, let us go. Why shouldn't we? My Nastia here has never been to the theater. My goodness, what joy! We got ready at once, put on our best clothes, and set off. Though Auntie was blind, she still wanted to hear the music. Besides, she really is a kind old soul and very much wanted me to have fun, though we never would have gone by ourselves. What I thought of the Barber of Seville, I won't say. It's not important. But all that evening, our lodger looked at me so kindly, talked so nicely, that I saw that he'd only meant to test me in the morning when he proposed that I should go with him alone. It was such a joy. I went to bed so proud, so happy. My heart beat so fast that I became a little feverish. I um, expected that he would come and see us more often after that, but that didn't happen. He almost entirely stopped visiting. He would come by about once a month and then only to invite us to the theater. We went two more times. I, I wasn't happy on those evenings. I thought that he simply felt sorry for me because I lived such a lonely life with my aunt, and that was all. As time went on, I grew more and more restless. I, I couldn't still, I couldn't read, I couldn't work. Sometimes I laughed wildly or did something to annoy auntie. At other times, I would cry uncontrollably. I grew thin and nearly became ill. The opera season ended, and our lodger gave up coming to see us. Whenever we met, always on the staircase, of course, he would bow so silently, so gravely, as though he did not want to speak, and go down to the front door while I went on standing in the middle of the stairs, as red as a cherry, for all my blood rushed to my head at the sight of him. Well, now comes the end. Just a year ago in May, the lodger came to us and told Auntie that his business here was finished and that he must go back to Moscow for a year. When I heard that, I sank into a chair half dead. Thankfully, Auntie didn't notice. Having informed us that he would be leaving us, he bowed and went away. What was I to do? I, I thought and fretted, and at last I made up my mind. The next day he was to go away, and I made up my mind to end it all that evening when Auntie went to bed. And so it happened. I, I put some clothes in a bag, and with bag in hand, more dead than alive, I, I went upstairs to our lodger. It was a slow climb. When I opened his door, I it trembled so that I could hardly stand. Crying out at my ghostly appearance, he rushed to give me some water. My heart beat so violently that my head ached and I did not know what I was doing. I put my bag down on his bed, sat down beside it, hid my face in my hands and gave way to a flood of tears. I think he understood it all at once and looked at me so sadly that my heart hurt. Listen, Nastia, listen, I can't do anything. I'm a poor man, I have nothing, not even a decent position. How could we live if I were to marry you? We talked for a long time, but at last I became frantic. I said that I, I could not go on living with Auntie, that I would run away from her, that I did not want to be pinned to her, that I would go with him to Moscow if he liked, because I could not live without him. Shame and pride and love were all clamoring in me at once. I fell on the bed almost in convulsions. I was so afraid of a refusal. He sat in silence for some minutes. Then got up, came over to me, and took me by the hand. Listen, 
My dear Swede Nastia, I swear that if, if I'm ever in a position to marry, you will make my happiness. I can assure you that now you are the only one who can make me happy. I'm going to Moscow for just a year. I hope to establish myself there. When I come back, if you still love me, I swear we will be happy. <laughs> Now it is impossible. I'm not able. I have not the right to promise anything. But if I don't make it back within a year, I swear I will eventually still come for you sometime. That is, of course, if you haven't come to prefer someone else. For I cannot and will not bind you by any sort of promise. That was what he said to me. And the next day, he went away. We had agreed not to say a word to my aunt. That was his wish. Well, my story is nearly finished now. A year has passed. He's arrived in Petersburg. He's been here for three days, and... And... And what? And up to now, he's not reached out to me. There's no sign or sound of him. <sighs> Nastia. Nastia, please don't cry. H how do you know? P perhaps he's not here yet. He could be he is, waiting he is, for- He is here and I know it. We had agreed at the time the evening before we, he went away when he said all that I had told you and had come to an understanding. And then we came out here for a walk on this embankment it was 10 o'clock, we sat on a bench. I, I was not crying then. Everything he said to me at the time was so sweet. He said that when he returned and if I did not refuse him, then we, we would tell Auntie about it all. Now he is here and I know it, and yet he's not come. Good God, isn't there anything I can do to help you? Tell me, Nastia, should I go to him? Would that be possible? No, of course not. But uh, I'll, I'll tell you what you should do. You should write him a letter. No, no, that's impossible. I, I can't do that. <laughs> How is it impossible? Why is it impossible? Listen, listen to me, Nastia. It all depends on what sort of letter you write. There are letters and letters and... Uh, Nastia, trust me, I, I am right. I, I wouldn't give you bad advice. You took the first step before, why not now? I, I, I can't, I, I can't. It would seem so, as though I were forcing myself on him. Nastia, no, because y you have a right to, in fact, because he made you a promise. Besides, I can see that from everything you've said that he is a man of delicate feeling, that he behaved very well, yes. What did he do? He bound himself by a promise. He said that if he married anyone, he would marry no one but you. And yet he gave you full liberty to refuse him. Under such circumstances, you may take the first step. You have the right. You are in the privileged position. If, for instance, you wanted to release him from his promise and perhaps right. choose... But what would you write to him? Write to him? Yes, in the letter you suggested that I write. The, the letter? Uh, I'll tell you what I would write. I'd start with, dear sir. Should I uh, really begin like that, dear sir? You certainly should. Though, maybe, I don't know. I, I suppose there's well, many ways you could well, try to form that. Dear sir, I, I must apologize for, but no, there's no need to apologize. The facts themselves justify everything. Write simply, dear sir, I have decided to write to you. Forgive me for my impatience, but I have lived in hope contentedly for a whole year. Can you blame me for being unable to endure a further day of doubt? 
now that you have come back to Petersburg, perhaps you've changed your mind. If so, this letter is to tell you that I do not repine. No, no, not repine. That I do not blame you. I do not blame you because I have no power over your heart. Such is my fate. You are, I know, an honorable man. You will not smile or be vexed at these impatient lines. Remember that they're written by a poor girl, that she is alone, that she has no one to confide in, no one to direct her, and that she herself could never control her fate. But forgive me if a doubt has stolen, if only for a moment into my heart. You are not capable of insulting, even in thought, her who so loved and so loves you. Yes, yes, that's exactly what I was thinking. Oh, you've solved my difficulties. God has sent you to me. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> thank me? <laughs> Why, <laughs> what for? For God's having sent me? <laughs> yes, yes, for that too. Ah, uh, Nastia, if we are thanking people, allow me to thank you for not chasing me away and for my being able to remember you my whole life. Well, enough, enough. There's something else. The lodger and I made an agreement when he left that as soon as he arrived in town, he would let me know by leaving a letter with some good, simple people of my acquaintance who know nothing about the situation. Or if it were impossible to write a letter, for a letter does not always tell everything, he would be here at 10 o'clock on the day he arrived, here where we had arranged to meet. Now it's been three days and there's no sign of him and no letter. It's impossible for me to get away from Auntie in the mornings. Tomorrow, could you give my letter to those kind of people I just spoke of? They will pass it on to him. And if there's an answer, you can bring it tomorrow at 10 o'clock. But the, the letter, the letter, you have to write the letter first, so it must be the day after tomorrow? The letter. The letter. But... She did not finish her thought. She turned her little face away from me, flushed like a rose. And I suddenly felt in my hand a letter which had evidently been written long before all ready and sealed up. A sweet and charming recollection of a theatrical moment floated through my mind. Rosina. Rosina. <laughs> yes, Rosina. I almost embraced her with delight while she blushed as only she could blush and laughed through the tears which gleamed like pearls on her black eyelashes. Come, that's enough, it's late. Goodbye now. You have the letter with the address to which you are to take it. Goodbye. Until we meet again. Till tomorrow. She pressed both my hands warmly, nodded her head, and flew like a swallow down her side street. I stood for a long time following her with my eyes. Till tomorrow. Till tomorrow. It was ringing in my ears as she vanished from my sight.
and then there was the third white knight. As I recollect it, I can't help but think how wonderful one can feel when filled with joy and happiness, how brimming over with love the heart can be. One so longs to share one's ecstasies with others. One wants everyone to be cheerful, everyone to be laughing. How infectious that joy is. And there was such a softness, such a warmth in her words towards me on that third night. How attentive and friendly she was. How tenderly she tried to give me strength. Oh, the seductiveness of happiness. I was bewitched and I took it all for the real thing. I thought that she... <laughs> but, my God, how could I have thought it? How could I have been so blind when everything belonged to another, when nothing was mine, when in fact her very tenderness to me, her affection, her love, yes, love for me was nothing else but joy at the thought of seeing, embracing another man. And maybe the desire to include me in her happiness? When he didn't come, when we waited in vain, she frowned. She grew timid and discouraged. Her movements, her words were no longer so lively, so light, so playful. And strange to say, she redoubled her attentiveness to me, as though instinctively desiring to lavish on me what she so anxiously desired for herself. My Nastia was so downcast, so dismayed, that I think at last she realized that I loved her and was sorry for my poor love. Yes, when we are unhappy, we feel more deeply the unhappiness of others. Feelings that are not muted, but concentrated. I had gone that night to meet her with a full heart impatient to see her again. I had no idea that I should feel as I do now, that it would not all end so happily. She was beaming with pleasure. She was expecting an answer. The answer was to be he himself. He was to come to run at her call. And she arrived a whole hour before I did. And at first she laughed at everything and giggled at every word I said. Do you know why I'm so glad? So glad to see you. Oh, I like you so much today. Well, why? I like you because you haven't fallen in love with me. You know, some men in your place would have been pestering and worrying me, would have been sighing and moaning. Well, you're so nice, so, so understanding. Honestly, you're such a good friend. Yes, God has sent you to me. What would I have done without you here now? You're so selfless and loyal. You truly care for me. When I'm married, we'll still be great friends, more than brother and sister. I will care for you almost as much as I do for him. You seem to be very excited, full <laughs> of nervous energy. Are you worried that he might not come? Oh, dear. If I weren't so very happy, your lack of faith, your doubts would make me cry. And yet, uh, but no, no, I'll think about that later. For now, I'll only say that you're right, that I'm not completely myself. I'm full of suspense and feel a little lightheaded, but that's enough about feelings. That moment we heard footsteps. And in the darkness, we saw a figure coming towards us. We were both startled. She almost cried out, and I made a movement as though to turn away, but we were mistaken. It was not he. What are you afraid of? Why did you begin to move away? Come on, what is it? We'll meet him together. I, I want him to see how fond we are of each other. How fond we are of each other. <laughs> fond? Oh, Nastia. Nastia, how much you told me and saying it like this. This fondness at such a moment can make the heart grow cold and the soul heavy. 
Your words are icy, but my emotions burn like fire. Oh, how blind you are, Nastia. How unbearably blind a happy person can be sometimes. But how could I ever be angry with you? Listen, Nastia. Do you want to know how I manage this day? Oh, why, of course. How? How? Tell me quickly. Why didn't you say anything sooner? Did everything go all right? To begin with, Nastia, after I had carried out all your errands, gone to see your good friends, given them the letter, then, then I went home and I went to bed. <laughs> Is that all? <laughs> yes, uh, almost all. I, I woke up an hour before our meeting and yet I felt as if I hadn't slept. I don't know what came over me, but I, I, I wanted to tell you all about it. It was as if time were standing still, as if one sensation, one feeling would remain with me from then on, and that one moment would go on for all eternity. As if life had come to a standstill for me. When I woke up, it seemed as though some sweet, soft music, long familiar, heard somewhere in the past but forgotten, had come back. It seemed it had been clamoring at my heart all my life, and only now no, am I able goodness. to realize oh, my that- my goodness! What are you talking about? I don't understand a word you're saying. Uh, Nastia, I, I wanted, I, I want to convey to you the strange feeling that I Stop. feel as if I'm- st Hush. <laughs> oh, yes. In one instant, the sly damsel had guessed, and suddenly she became extraordinarily talkative, merry and mischievous. She took my arm, laughed, wanted me to laugh too, and every confused word I uttered evoked from her prolonged ringing laughter. I began to grow angry. She had suddenly begun flirting. Do you know, I actually do feel a little annoyed that you haven't fallen in love with me. There's no understanding human nature, but all the same, Mr. Unapproachable, you can't blame me for being so honest. I tell you everything, everything, every foolish thought that comes into my head. Listen, I believe it's 11. The slow toll of a bell rang out from a distant tower. She suddenly stopped laughing, sat still and began to count. Yes, it's 11. I immediately regretted that I had impeded, had quashed her flowing spirits. Watching her count the strokes, I cursed myself for my spiteful impulse. I felt sorry for her, yet I did not know how to atone for my sin. So I began comforting her, offering reasons for his not coming, advancing various arguments, proofs. No one could have been easier to deceive than she was at that moment, but to be honest, anyone at such a moment would listen to any consolation, whatever it may be, and be overjoyed if the shadow of an excuse could be found. It's simply impossible. He couldn't have come yet. You have so befuddled and confused me, Nastia, that like you, I have lost track of the time. Think about it. He probably only just received your letter, and suppose he may not be able to read it yet. He might have not even read it yet, and suppose if he were going to answer your letter, that answer wouldn't arrive till tomorrow. If you'd like, I can go and fetch it for you first thing in the morning. Or perhaps he wasn't even home when the letter arrived. He might not have been able to read it yet. Just consider there are thousands of possibilities. Anything can happen, you know. Yes. Yes, I, I didn't think of all that. Of course, anything can happen. But yes, please go as early as possible tomorrow morning. And if you get anything, let me know at once. You know where I live, don't you? And she began repeating her address to me. Then she suddenly became so tender, so solicitous of me. 
She seemed to listen attentively to what I told her, but when I asked her a question, she was silent, was confused, and tried to turn away. I could see that she was crying. Don't. Please don't. How can you? Oh, how silly you're being. <laughs> I, I was thinking about you. You, you've been so kind to me that I'd have to be made of stone if I did not feel it. And do you know, I wonder why isn't he like you? Why isn't he you? He's not as good as you, though I, I love him more than you. Of course, it, it may be that I don't understand him fully yet. You know, I always was kind of afraid of him. He was always so serious, even a little proud. But I, I know it's only that he seems like that. I know there is more tenderness in his heart than in mine. I remember how he looked at me. You remember when I went into him with my bag? And yet I respect him so much. Too much, which I guess shows that we are not equals. No, no, Nastia. It shows that you love him more than anything else in the world far more than yourself. Yes, supposing that's so. But do you know what strikes me now? And I'm not speaking only about him, but generally. All this came to me some time ago. How come we can't all be like brothers and sisters together? Why is it that even the best of us always seem to hide something, to hold something back? Why not say straight out what's in one's heart? As it is, everyone appears to want to seem tougher, stronger than they really are, as if we were all afraid of doing harm to our feelings by being too quick to express them. Ah, uh, Nastia, what you say is true, but there are so many reasons for holding back. No, no, you are not like that. I really don't know how to tell you how I feel, but it seems to me that you, for instance, at this present moment. It seems to me that you are sacrificing something for me. Please forgive me for saying so. I'm a simple girl, you know, I've seen very little of life and I really sometimes don't know how to say things, but I only want to tell you that, that I am grateful, that I want so much to, may God give you happiness. What you told me about your dreamer is not true. That is, I mean, it's not true of you. You're recovering. You're quite a different man than what you described. If you ever fall in love with someone, may God give you happiness with her. I, I won't wish anything for her, for she will be happy with you. I know I am a woman myself, so you must believe me when I tell you so. Well. It's clear he won't come tonight. It's late. He'll come tomorrow. Yes, yes. I, I see now why it wasn't likely he would come tonight, but he will come tomorrow. Well, it's time I should go home. And as we prepared to part, she looked into my eyes and said sincerely, We shall always be friends, won't we? Oh. Nastia, Nastia, if you only knew how lonely I was at that moment. We planned to meet the following evening, but as we were saying our goodbyes, clouds began to gather and a mist settled down on us. I said that the next day would be an ugly, rainy one, and at first she made no answer. She didn't want to cast a cloud over her expectations for the following evening. For her, the next day was going to be bright and clear and no cloud should be allowed to obscure her happiness. And yet she ultimately conceded. If it rains, perhaps I shall not come tomorrow, but the day after tomorrow, I will come. I will definitely come. Be sure to be here. I'll want to see you and tell you everything. The next day was, in fact, dull, dark, and rainy, without a glimmer of sunlight like the old age that lies before me. 
throughout the next morning and afternoon, I was oppressed by strange, gloomy thoughts. Vague questions haunted me, but I had neither the power nor the will to face them. It was all beyond my ken. And then the evening arrived. And with Nastia's high hopes from the night before, I thought she would ignore the day's rain, and yet she did not come. As for me, as soon as it struck nine o'clock, I could not stay indoors. I dressed for the outside, went out in spite of the weather, and was soon at our rendezvous spot. I sat there for a while, but then I went to her street. But I felt ashamed of letting myself go so far. And when but two steps from her door, I turned back and went home more depressed than I ever had been before. <sighs> what a damp, dreary day. If the weather had been better and the skies clear, I might have walked about wandering the streets all night. But on returning to my rooms, I sought to console myself by repeating the simple mantra, tomorrow, tomorrow, she will tell me everything tomorrow. His letter had not yet arrived, that was not surprising, but then I couldn't help but wonder if they weren't already together. And yes, there was a fourth white night. My God, how it all ended. Oh, what a night. I arrived at nine o'clock and she was already there. And I saw her from a good distance. She was standing as she had the first evening, overlooking the river with her elbows on the rails. She didn't even hear me coming up to her. Nastia? Well, well, give it to me. What? what? The letter. W where's the letter? Haven't you brought it? No, there is no letter. Hasn't he come to you yet? Well, God forgive him. Yes, God forgive him if he leaves me like that. Nastia, don't, don't. <laughs> don't try and comfort me. Don't talk about him. Don't tell me that, that he will come, that he has not cruelly and crassly cast me aside. Why? Why? What did I do wrong? Was it something I put in my letter, the cursed letter? No. Oh, how horribly cruel it is. And not a line, not a line. He might have at least written that he does not want me, that he rejects me, but not a line for three days? Oh, how easy it is for him to wound, to insult a poor defenseless girl whose only fault is that she loves him. Oh, what I've suffered these days. My God, when I think that I was the first to go to him, that I, I humbled myself before him, cried, begged him to love me, and after that, no. No, listen, it, it isn't so. It can't be so. It's not natural. Either you're mistaken or I am. Perhaps he hasn't received the letter. Perhaps he still knows nothing about it. How could anyone? Tell me, for God's sake, explain it to me. I can't understand it. How could anyone behave as heartlessly as he has behaved to me? Not one word. Why the lowest creature on earth is treated more compassionately. Perhaps he's heard something. Perhaps someone has told him something about me. What do you think? Nastia, I'll go and talk to him for you tomorrow. You will? I will tell him everything. I will explain everything. Yes. Yes. Write him another letter. Don't say no, Nastia. Don't say no. I will make him show you respect. He'll hear from me, and if he can't no. realize what he's no. doing, he... No more. 
and not another word, not another line for me. Enough. I'm done. I, I don't know him. I don't love him anymore. I will forget him. I'll. I'll. Calm yourself. Calm yourself, Nastia. I am calm. <laughs> don't worry. It's it's nothing. It's only tears. They'll soon dry. Are you worried I'll harm myself or throw myself into the river? Uh, I, I, I just... Tell me, you wouldn't have behaved like this, would you? You wouldn't have abandoned a girl who came to you of her own free will. You wouldn't have tossed her away like a ragged old piece of clothing. You would have taken care of her. You would have seen that she was alone, that she did not know how to look after herself, that she could not prevent herself from loving you, that it was not her fault, not her fault, that she had done nothing. Oh, God, oh, God. Nastia, Nastia, you're, you're torturing me. You're killing me, Nastia. I, I, I can't be silent anymore. I have to speak. I have to tell you what's surging inside of me. What? What's wrong? Listen to me, Nastia. What I'm about to tell you is all nonsense, all stupid, all impossible. I know this can never be, but I can't be silent. So, so knowing what you're suffering now, I beg you ahead of time to forgive me. What is it? What is it? Tell me what's the matter. It's impossible, but I love you, Nastia. There it is. Now everything is out. Now you can decide whether you want to go on talking with me, whether you want to listen to what I'm about to say to you. Well, what uh, then? What of it? I knew you loved me from the start. Only I thought that you simply, well, liked me very much. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, yes. At first it was just simply liking Nastia, but... But now, now I am in just the same position as you were when you went to him with your packed bag in a, a worse position than you because he cared for no one as you do. What are you saying to me? I don't understand you in the least, but tell me, what's this for? Not what for, but why are you so suddenly, oh God, I'm talking nonsense to you. What's to be done? What am I to do? I, I am to blame. I have abused your, but uh, no, no, I, I am not to blame. There is no blame. I believe that. I, I know that, Nastia. I, I can't hurt you. I can't wound you in any way. I was your friend and I'm still your friend. I have betrayed no trust and my love won't hurt anybody. And, and as you say, they're only tears. They'll soon dry. They will dry, Nastia. I... Stop. Please stop. Oh my goodness. No, Nastia, I, I can't stop. I, I can't stay here. You can't see me anymore. I'll say all I have to say, then go away. I only wanted to tell you that you would never have found out that I loved you. I would have kept my secret. I wouldn't have worried you at such a time with my selfish love. No, no, I couldn't be silent. I had to speak. You spoke of it yourself. You, you asked me to speak. You pressed me to speak. It's your fault. Your fault, not mine. You can't, you can't drive me away from you, Nastia. No, no I, I won't drive you away from me. No. You won't drive me away? But no, no, I'll leave you anyway. I, I swear I'll go. I but first I'll tell you everything. When you were sitting there crying, when you were in such pain because you, because, oh, let me say this to you, Nastia, because, because your love was refused, because you were rejected. I, I, I felt so much love, Nastia, so much love for you. And I felt so frustrated that I couldn't help you with my love. That I couldn't be silent. I had to speak. I have to speak. Yes. Speak. Tell me. Talk to me. I, I know it's strange that I should say this, but speak. 
I'll, I'll explain it to you afterwards. I'll, I'll tell you everything. You're feeling sorry for me, Nastia. You're simply feeling sorry. Well, what's done can't be undone. What's said can't be unsaid. Isn't that so? Well, now you know, that's a starting point, fine, but th th there's more. When you were sitting there crying, I, I thought to myself, oh, just let me tell you what I was thinking. I, I thought that, I know it can't be Nastia, but I, I, I thought that you somehow, without it having to do with me, had ceased to love him. And then I thought yesterday and the day before yesterday, Nastia, that I had, that I certainly would have succeeded in making you love me. You know, you said it yourself, you almost love me. Well, what's next? That's nearly all I wanted to say to you. All that's left now to say is how it would be if you loved me. Only that, nothing more. Listen to me, my friend, for whatever happens, you are still my friend. I, I am a poor, humble man of no great consequence, but th that's not the point. I, I don't seem to be able to say how I'm feeling, Nastia. I'm so confused, only, only I would love you. I would love you so that even if you still loved him, even if you went on loving that man, you would never feel that my love was a burden to you. You would only feel that by your side at every moment was beating a warm, a warm, grateful, grateful heart. A warm heart always devoted to you, Nastia. Oh God, what have you done to me? And don't be unhappy. I, I don't want you to be unhappy. Listen to me, let me tell you something. If he's abandoned me now, if he's forgotten me, though I still love him, I, I don't want to mislead or lie to you, but answer me. If I were to come to love you, that is, for instance, if I, oh, you are a dear, dear friend, and to think, to think how I wounded you when I laughed at your love, when I praised you for not falling in love with me, oh, God, how did I not foresee this? How could I have missed it? How could I have been so stupid? But, well, I I've made up my mind. I I'm going to tell stop, you- Stop, stop, Nastia. I'll go away, that's what I'll do. I'm just tormenting you here. Here you are feeling sorry for having laughed at me. No, no, I, I won't have you in addition to your sorrow. Of course it's my fault. But goodbye. Wait, listen to me, please listen. Why? What for? I loved him, but I'll get over it. I'll try. No, I, I must get over it. I have to get over it. I feel that. Who knows? Maybe even today. Yes, I, I hate him. I hate him for he's been laughing at me while you've been here weeping with me. You've not turned your back on me as he has. You love me while he has never loved me. In fact, I... I should love you. Yes, I, I do love you. I love you as you love me. I told you so before. You heard it yourself. I love you because you are better than he is because you are nobler than he is because because he <sighs> girl's emotions swelled to the point that she could say no more she laid her head upon my shoulder and wept bitterly i tried to comfort her but she could not stop crying wait wait it will be over in a minute don't don't think that these tears it's nothing, it's a weakness. Wait till it's over. And at last, she stopped crying and dried her eyes. She sat silently. I wanted to speak, but still she begged me to wait. 
and remained silent. At last, she plucked up courage. Please, please don't think that I am flighty or fickle. Don't think that I can forget and change so quickly. I loved him for a whole year, and I swear by God that I have never, never even in thought been unfaithful to him. He has despised me. He has been laughing at me. God forgive him, but he has insulted and wounded me, and I can't. I do not love him, for I can only love someone who is good, who understands me, who is generous. That's how I am, and he is not worthy of me. Well, that's enough of him. In, in any case, it's better I found out now what he was than discovering later. Well, it's over. But who knows? Who knows? Perhaps my love for him was a mistaken feeling, a childish delusion, a fantasy resulting perhaps from my having been so strictly watched over by Auntie. I ought to love another man, not him, a different man who would have pity on me. And, and, but th that's enough about that. I only wanted to tell you that if, although I love him, no, did love him, if in spite of this you still say, if you feel that your love is so great that it may at last drive away my own feeling for him, if you will have pity on me, if you do not want to leave me alone to my fate without hope, if you are ready to love me always as you do now, then I swear to you that my gratitude, no, my love, will at last be worthy of your love. <laughs> oh, Nastia. Nastia, oh, Nastia. No more, no more, not another word about it. Everything has been said, hasn't it, hasn't it? You're happy, I'm happy too. Wait, spare me. Come, let's walk and talk about something else, please. Yes, Nastia, enough <laughs> about that now. I, I am happy, let's. Yes, uh, let's talk of other things, let's, yes. <laughs> and we didn't know what to talk about. We laughed, we wept. We said thousands of meaningless, incoherent things. At one moment, we walked along the pavement, then suddenly turned back and crossed the road. Then we stopped and went back again to the embankment. We were like children. I'm living alone now, Nastia? Of course, you know, I'm a poor man. I've only got 1,200 rubles, but uh, that, that doesn't matter, I... Uh, of course not, and Auntie has her pension, so she'll be no burden. Oh, we must take Auntie with us. Uh, of course, we must take Auntie, but there's also my housekeeper, Matrona. Oh, and we have Thecla, too. Matrona's a good woman, but she does have one fault. She has no imagination, <laughs> absolutely <laughs> none, but that, that yeah. doesn't matter. <laughs> they can room together. Only you must move in with us tomorrow. With you? You think that, well, I suppose that does make sense. Uh, yes, you can rent a room from us. We have a top floor room. It's empty. We had an old lady lodging there, but she's gone away, and I know that Auntie would like to rent it to a young man. I asked her why a young man, and she says, oh, because you, I am old, Nastia, but don't get the idea that I want to be the husband for you. So I guess that was exactly the idea. Oh, Nastia. <laughs> all right, all right, <laughs> and enough, enough. But tell me, where do you live? I've forgotten. Over near the bridge in the Berenikoff house. Oh, that big house. <laughs> Yes, that big house. Oh, well, it's a nice house. But you know, you'd better give up your rooms and move in with us as soon as possible. Tomorrow, Nastia, tomorrow. I owe a little for my rent there, but th that's all right. I should get my pay soon. And maybe I can give lessons. I'll learn something myself and then give lessons. Wonderful. And before long, I expect to receive a bonus. We'll do fine. So by tomorrow, you will be my lodger. And we'll go see the Barber of Seville.
I hear the theater company's offering it again soon. Yes, well, maybe we better see something else and not the Barber of Seville. Uh, of course, um, something else, uh, that would be better. I, I wasn't thinking, I, I'm sorry, I... And as we talked like this, we wandered along in a sort of intoxicated haze. We were unaware of what was happening around us. We would stop and talk for a long time at one place, and then we would walk on again, and goodness knows where we went. And then again, tears, and again, laughter. All of a sudden, Nastia would want to go home, and I would not dare to object, but would insist on seeing her to the door. We would set off, but in a quarter of an hour, found ourselves back at the embankment at our original meeting place. Then she would sigh, and tears would come into her eyes again. I would feel the chill of dismay, but she would press my hand and force me to talk, to walk, to chatter as before. Well, it's time I really did go home. I think it must be very late. Yes, uh, only I won't be able to sleep tonight. I won't go home. I don't think I'll sleep either, but do see me home. Yes, uh, of course. Only this time we must really get to my house. <laughs> we must, we must. <laughs> On your honor, for you know one must go home sometime. On my honor. <laughs> well, off we go. Off we go. Oh, but look at the sky. What a bright blue sky. What a moon. Tomorrow will be a lovely day. Look, that little cloud is covering it now. Look, look. Oh, no, it's passed by. Look, look. But Nastia did not look at the cloud. She stood mute as though turned to stone. She timidly huddled up close to me. Her hands trembled in mine. I looked at her, and she pressed still more closely to me. At that moment, a young man passed by us. He stopped and stared at us intently, and then again took a few more steps on. Who oh, is it, Nastia? It's him. Nastia? I heard a voice from behind us, and at the same moment, the young man took several more steps towards us. Nastia, is that you? <laughs> <laughs> My God, how she cried out, how she started, how she tore herself out of my arms and rushed to meet him. I didn't move, I just watched them, utterly crushed. But she had hardly given him her hand, had hardly flung herself into her arms when she turned to me again, was beside me again in a flash, and before I knew what was what, she threw both her arms around my neck and gave me a warm, tender kiss. And then, without saying a word to me, she went back to him, took his hand, and drew him away. I stood for a long time watching after them. At last, the two vanished from my sight. My lovely night had ended suddenly, and then came the morning after. The next day was wet and gloomy. The rain fell and beat unmercifully against my window panes. It was dark in my room and gray outside. My head ached, fever was stealing over my limbs. And then Matrona was standing over me. There's a letter for you, sir. The postman brought it? I asked who the letter was from. I don't know, sir. Better look. Maybe it's written there who it's from. I broke the seal. It was from her. 
After a deep breath, I read it. Oh, forgive me, forgive me. I beg you on my knees to forgive me. I deceived you and myself. It was a dream, a mirage. My heart aches for you today. Oh, forgive me, forgive me. Don't be angry at me for my feelings towards you haven't changed in the least. I told you that I would love you. Well, I love you now. I more than love you. Oh, my God, if only I could love you both at once. Oh, if only you were him. Why isn't he you echoed in my mind? I remembered your words, Nastia. I read on. God knows what I wouldn't do for you now. I know that you are sad and depressed. I have wounded you. But, you know, when one loves, a wrong is soon forgotten. And you do love me, don't you? Thank you. Yes, thank you for that love. For it will live in my memory like a sweet dream which lingers long after awakening. For I will remember forever that instant when you opened your heart to me like a brother and so generously accepted the gift of my shattered heart to care for it, nurse it, and heal it. If you forgive me, my memory of you will overflow with everlasting gratitude. I, I will treasure that memory. I will be true to it. I will never betray it. I can never betray my heart. It is too constant. As you could see, it returned quickly yesterday to him to whom it has always belonged. We shall meet again. You will visit us. You will not leave us. You will forever be a friend, a brother to me. And when you see me again, you will give me your hand. Yes, you will give it to me. You have forgiven me, haven't you? You do love me as before. Oh, love me, do not forsake me, for I love you so in this moment. I am worthy of your love. I will deserve it, my dear. Next week, I am to be married to him. He has come back full of love. He's never forgotten me. Don't be irritated at my writing about him. I want to come and see you with him. You will like him, won't you? Forgive me. Remember and love your Nastia. Read that letter over and over again. Tears rushed to my eyes and at last it fell from my hands and I hid my face. Deary, I say deary. At that moment, Matrona returned. I've cleared all the cobwebs off the ceiling. You could give a party here, or even have a wedding now. I looked at Matrona. She was still a hearty, youngish, older woman. And suddenly I pictured her with lusterless eyes. A wrinkled face, bent, decrepit. And I don't know why, but I suddenly pictured my room grown old like Matrona. The walls and floors all looked discolored. Everything seemed squalid. The cobwebs were thicker than ever. And then when I looked out of my window, it seemed that the house opposite me had grown old and shadowy too that the stucco on the columns were breaking off and crumbling and that the cornices were cracked and black and that the walls, once a vivid, deep yellow, were a dirty beige. And perhaps it was merely that the sun peeping out from behind the clouds for a moment had suddenly been hidden once more by a veil of rain and everything had again grown dingy dismal, dulled before my eyes. Or perhaps it was that the whole vista of my future flashed before me, 
so forlorn, so foreboding, and I saw myself just as I am now, 15 years hence, older, in the same room, just as solitary. With the same Matrona grown no cleverer for those 15 years. Yes. I remember the overwhelming pain you brought me. But don't imagine that I would ever bear you a grudge, Nastia. That I would ever cast a dark cloud over your serene, untroubled happiness. That by my bitter reproaches, I could have ever caused distress to your heart or poisoned it with a secret remorse and forced it to throb in anguish at the moment of bliss. That I could have ever crushed a single one of those tender blossoms which you had twined in your lovely dark brown hair as you went with him to the altar. Oh, never, never. May your sky always be clear. May your sweet smile always be bright and untroubled. And may you always be blessed for that moment of blissful happiness which you gave to another lonely and grateful heart. My God, a whole moment of happiness. Is that too little for the whole of a man's life? <laughs>